Valley in the snow, so we're changing things up a little bit this morning. First off, I want to uh, announce that uh, Dee just let me know if you stop by my office this week, there's a big abundance of Girl Scout cookies. So while you're out and about in this cold weather and need something to go with your warm coffee and hot chocolate, stop over there and get some cookies. We're glad you're here this morning. If you're watching us and joining us uh, virtually this morning, be sure and share our page. And uh, for others, our, our viewership keeps growing and growing. So we invite you to, to share it and share the ministry as, as part of it because uh, the digital community is becoming really large with us. Let's join together in worship. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. I'd like to invite you to stand if you'd like and join me in our opening music. Excellent is thy name, O oh Lord, how excellent is thy name. Heaven and earth together proclaim, how excellent is thy name. How excellent is thy name, O oh Lord, how excellent is thy name. Heaven and earth together proclaim, how excellent is thy name. How excellent is thy name, O oh Lord. Excellent is thy name. Heaven and earth together proclaim. How excellent is thy name. How excellent is thy name, O oh Lord. How excellent is thy name. Heaven and earth together proclaim. How excellent is thy name. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace. Mighty God, O oh Lord God Almighty. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too 
too wonderful comprehension. I never see the who can grasp your infinite wisdom. Who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty, Lord above. You are beautiful beyond description. Too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard, who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom? Depth of your love, you are beautiful beyond description, majesty, and throne above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. Oh, I stand, I stand. In love of you, holy God, to whom our praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Let's sing that last part. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. Oh, I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom our praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom our praise is due, I'll stand in awe of you. Please be seated. Oh, may God teach you the meaning of that name, Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, it is wisdom's mystery, God with us. Sages look at it and wonder. Angels desire to see it. The plumb line of reason cannot reach halfway into its depths. The eagle wings of science cannot fly so high and the piercing eye of the vulture of research cannot see it. God with us. It is hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. His legions fly apace. The black-winged dragon of the pit quails before it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and do you but whisper the word, God with us, and back he falls, confounded and confused. Satan trembles when he hears that name. God with us. It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor acknowledge his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? God with us is the sufferer's comfort 
is the balm of his woe, is the alleviation of his misery, is the sleep that God gives to his beloved, is the rest after exertion and toil. God with us is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glorified, is the song of the redeemed, is the chorus of angels, and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. God with us. Psalm 61, verses 1 through 2 say, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I call to you. I love the, the Lord. He heard my cry and bid every grow long as I Yeah. 
Well, it's hard running everything at once and getting it all working, but uh, thanks to Bill Featherston, he's going to take over for me up there, so register all complaints with him from now on. We had to do a little rearranging of our service today to make this work, but our scripture lesson is from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. If you've ever read John's Gospel, it's the communion scene takes up several chapters of this book. Jesus sitting down with his disciples, his followers, and he's teaching them as they sit at the table. And then when they're done, he gets up and he leads them through the vineyard and he tells that wonderful story of how we are the, he is the vine and they're the, you know, all that stuff like that. But it's an extended display of Jesus' teachings. And in John's gospel, unlike the synoptics, Jesus' teaching here is about the power of love. And I want to read these verses to you. Chapter 14, 15 through 27. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth cannot receive because it was neither sees him nor loves him you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you I will never leave you orphaned I am coming to you in a little while the world will no longer see me but you will see me because I live you also will live on that day you will know that I am in my father and you in me They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. Now I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything that I've said, remind you of everything that I've done. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This is the gift of the Scriptures. Thanks be to God. May we pray. Father, it's been a rough week, with the snow and the pandemic still raging, with all the uncertainties and challenges we face. It feels as though we're just languishing, cut off from our communities and our fellowship, cut off from our friendship and our families. We simply feel so very alone and forgotten. It's been a hard several months dealing with the partisan divisions, dealing with a country that's on the brink of the Civil War, dealing with a pandemic where There are two sides that yell and scream and fight with one another. We struggle to do what is right. We try to listen. We try to understand. We try to follow our reason. And yet at the end of the day, we just feel so very alone. Cut off from the world we thought we once knew. God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to again remind us of everything Jesus said and everything that he taught. We pray that you would send forth your Holy Spirit to give us that gift of love once more, that we may turn our hearts from the fear and challenges of our day to embrace the power and the kingdom of your love. For love is truly the only thing that has ever changed world history. And though we get caught up in the news events of our day, help us to never forget the power of your love that can change all of reality. When Jesus stretched out his hands upon that cross, 
He changed the world forever. He showed us the meaning of love. That a friend would lay down his life in salvation of another. And that is exactly what Jesus did for all of us. We come here today in the midst of our loneliness to be here with you. And even if we are here in person or sitting at our homes, watching this on a TV screen, help us to believe and to know we are never alone. You are always with us, now and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. When I shipped out to Iraq back in 07 and we were assigned to the Seabees and Marines as a chaplain, uh, one of my most poignant experiences was driving out in the midst of the desert with a convoy of Seabees and Marines and we stopped off the side of the road, take a little break. And there, you know, you can just see the stars as bright as day. It's just so beautiful. And I remember one of the uh, sailors, one of the Seabees asking me, he goes, you know, we've been out here several months. It sure does feel lonely. I miss my family. I miss my friends. I miss my job. I miss my country. I just feel so utterly alone. He goes, Chaplain, do you ever feel that way? I said, yeah, of course. But I don't feel that way here in Iraq. He goes, really? Why not? And I said, because I've trained with you guys, you Marines, you Seabees, long enough to know that no matter what happens out here, you've got my back. No matter what transpires, you will pull me off this battlefield and you will bring me home. And I said, and that's a very comforting feeling to me knowing that I'm surrounded by some of the finest men and women that our country's ever produced and that we're out here and we have each other's backs. And I said, because of that, I don't feel alone. Yeah, I miss my family, I miss my friends, I miss all that, but I don't feel alone. Now, one of Jesus' most powerful teachings, it comes at the end of Matthew's Gospel. He tells them, as he's about to ascend into the heavens, he tells them, don't be afraid. I'll be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Now think back for a moment what his followers must have been experiencing. They had just witnessed his crucifixion and death. They were surprised by his resurrection. They have no idea what's going on. Something miraculous has happened. It's almost too good to be true. And as Jesus ascends to the heavens, he says, I'm leaving you now. But don't think I'm really leaving you. Because even though you can't see me, I'm going to be there for you. Always and everywhere. Now John's gospel picks up on that teaching and extends it, expands on it. In John's gospel, Jesus teaches all this during Holy Communion or the First Communion Supper. And I encourage you to read those chapters. There are several. But as they sit there eating together, Jesus talks about how they will never, ever be alone. He tells them, hey, in a little while you'll no longer see me, but hey, I'll still be here. The Father will send you the Holy Spirit so that no matter where you are, that spirit of love and comfort will surround you at all times and you'll never be alone. And it's a beautiful, beautiful description of all of Jesus' teachings that we are never alone in this life. Jesus is always there. Now I've experienced the depths of loneliness. I imagine all of you have too. When my first wife died, that was the loneliest moment of my life as I was up at four in the morning holding her hand and was so lonely and so quiet. And I had to remind myself that even in that moment of grief and death, I wasn't really alone. God was here, waiting to comfort me, waiting to hold me, waiting to take me by the hand. We experience loneliness in so many ways. 
I invite you to think back on some of the stories of the Bible about people in the midst of loneliness. You know, we think of these as miracle stories, but often it's not the miracle that Jesus is trying to talk about. It's that other human condition that Mother Teresa once commented is the worst disease humankind can ever experience. Not leprosy, but loneliness. And she said, I come out here to India not simply to treat lepers, but because I know that they are so lonely and so forgotten and so abandoned. I treat their physical ailment, but really what I'm really doing here is to remind them that even if society has rejected them, God hasn't. And I'm going to be the hands and the feet of Christ embracing them so that these outcasts will never feel that they're lonely or abandoned. I love Mother Teresa's story. You should read it sometime. Her struggles with God, but also how in life she saw that the human condition was one of loneliness. You go back to the beginning of Genesis and when Adam and Eve bite into the apple, the feeling they experience is loneliness, is estrangement. God comes to them and says, Adam, Eve, where are you? Trying to get them to recognize what's happened. You've broken our relationship. You're, you're cut off from me. Come back to me. He tries to get them to see that. Of course they don't because their loneliness is so overwhelming. They turn their back to God. And the story of the Bible begins with the question, how is God going to reconcile us back to the fellowship of love. And it starts in Genesis, and that's the story. That's the premise that must be answered. How will God make all this right? How will God restore our brokenness and restore us to the fellowship that we once enjoyed with Him? You go through those stories, and we finally meet Jesus, who gives us the answer. Now think for a moment everything He said and did. And this is the thing that often gets confusing because we church-going folk, we theologians, we make a mess of his teachings. We get into the condemnation judgment business. We're more worried about our rules and our dogma than we are about people's hearts and lives. It's all about what you believe. It's all about whether or not you toe the party line here at church. That's what we push. But that's not what Jesus pushed. He pushed an agenda of love. Remember that Sermon on the Mount after he gets through teaching and he comes down and his first action is to give them an example of what this teaching means in practice? You remember that story? He comes down and he meets a leper. And what does he do? Does he say like most church folk, hey, you're a leper, the Bible says you shouldn't be here, you should be outside town where you belong? That's what the Bible says. And we love quoting the Bible. Jesus says, no, come. And he reaches out and he embraces the man. And yeah, he heals him, but that's not the point of the story because, I mean, everybody in the ancient world believed in miracles. That was nothing. What shocked them was the fact Jesus embraced this guy, loved this man. Now, the Gospels are funny because Jesus will then go on to uh, embrace Peter's mother-in-law, I'm sure Peter's like, oh, really? Mother-in-laws too? We have to love them as well. He goes to embrace Gentiles and little children. He goes and sits by a well and he waits for this woman to come. And she shows up by herself. And you know, if you read the story, you should be asking, why is she there by herself? Because women in the ancient world went to wells together for protection. Well, Jesus quickly finds out why she's there by herself. She's been married five times and living with a sixth guy who's not even her husband. You can imagine how the town has rejected her. She's one of those women. She's not Christian. And Jesus starts talking to her. And she says, why are you talking to me? Not only am I a Samaritan and you a Jew, but I'm a woman, you're a man, and you obviously know history so why would you talk to me 
And Jesus has this amazing conversation with him about the power of love, the power of acceptance. And he embraces her. She was never alone in Jesus' eyes. There's another story in John's Gospel, the woman caught in adultery. I love this story because it's, man, men can be such hypocrites. They say that they've caught this woman in the very act of adultery. And uh, nobody ever stops to ask, well, hey, where's the dude at? Well, he got off scot-free because we've always had that double standard. And as they're wanting to stone and condemn her, Jesus says, hey, wait a minute. And he walks up to her. And then he bends down, writes something in the sand. And of course, all the men are suddenly shocked and embarrassed and shamed. And they walk away, dropping their stones. And he gets up and he says, hey, where did everybody go? And she says, I have no idea. He goes, well, if nobody here is going to condemn me, neither am I. Welcome home. You're never alone. You go through those stories, and if you actually read the Gospels, Jesus is always breaking down those barriers and boundaries that we set up between one another. You know, we label people. Oh, you're black, you're Hispanic, you're Russian, you're Hindu, you're Jew, you're gay, you're straight, you're a woman, you're a man. You know how the church does that. I mean, we're the most segregated place in America right now. Just about. Jesus breaks down all those labels and says, no, wait a minute. We're all here to love one another. We're all here because God created us from the dust of the ground and we're all equal in God's eyes. And we should treat everybody with that truth. Jesus warned us never to judge nor condemn because that's not our job. Our job here is to love one another. And he tells us again in the Gospel of John, the greatest commandment is to simply love one another. And you can imagine Jesus repeated that quite often because when you read about the disciples and the other people following Jesus, they have a hard time understanding that. Last week we looked at one of those guys, a religious scholar, who asked Jesus, well, what is the greatest commandment? Love God, love your neighbor? And Jesus goes, correct. And the guy said, well, wait a minute, who's my neighbor? And what kind of question is that when we ask it? It's a question that implies there are those who are my neighbors and there are those who are not. And don't we all have that list in our little heads of the people we're willing to love and the people we're not willing to love? Because there are certain people we just don't want to include in our approach. Right? They might be Republicans or Democrats, conservatives or liberals in today's society. But Jesus says, I'm telling you to love them anyway. Because that's who we are as the people of God. That's how we overcome the estrangement and loneliness that we're all experiencing. We're all there for one another. I had the blessing of growing up in a small town. I don't know how many of you had that blessing, but it's going to be more rare as the population moves to urban areas. But in that hometown, we were all there for one another. Oh yeah, we got on each other's nerves. We had our crazy individuals and our people that were just almost unlovable. But at the end of the day, we were there for each other. We loved one another, no matter who we were. And we stood up for each other. In today's world, that's becoming rare. And that's rather sad. Because that's not the kingdom that Jesus was trying to build. We are never alone. As long as we're willing to live by Jesus' commandments. The simple commandment to love one another. I find it a shame that the church has so screwed up this message. I find it shameful that when I talk to young people, the first thing they tell me is how 
fascinated, how interested, how much in love they are with Jesus Christ. And then in the same breath say, but I would never step foot in your church because the church is where I first met rejection. Did you know 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ? You know why they're homeless? Because churches have taught their parents to throw them into the streets. Pope Francis mentioned this a few weeks ago. He goes, what kind of family are you that you would abandon your child because of a sexual orientation? And Pope Francis condemned families who did that, and rightfully so. But it's the church that is failing to live by the commandments of Jesus. Why is it so hard to love everyone? Why is it so hard to leave behind our judgments and our condemnations and simply see someone as a child of God? Why is that so difficult? I wish I knew because I struggle with that. People get on my nerves. People say things. It's like, God, you're so crazy. At the end of the day, Jesus tells me to love them anyway. Because that's how we defeat that disease of loneliness. People crave community. They crave fellowship. They they want to belong. They want to be loved. And a lot of the anger and fear we're experiencing in today's society is simply the estrangement that we've created between one another. And we can overcome that by the power of love. I challenge you to go back and read the Gospels and read it through the lens of love. How everything Jesus said and did was about the power of love that reaches out to include everyone. We got that message so wrong and we need to retrieve it if the church is to have a future in our nation. May we pray. God, the past several months have been months of loneliness and languishing for so many of us. We are saddened and depressed. We feel cut off from one another. And we seek your healing. We seek your presence. We seek that promise that says that we are never alone, we are never abandoned, and that you will never leave us orphaned. We seek that power of love that reaches out in the midst of our despair to embrace us and to open our eyes to the fellowship of Christian communion. And God, no matter what we are experiencing at this moment. We pray that your spirit would break through our hearts, would whisper to us once again that Christ is with us always and everywhere, even to the ends of the earth. In your holy name we pray. Amen. At our baptism, while we were yet sinners, still cut off from one another, still broken and empty and confused. God sent His Son to pour out His love upon us so that our hearts might be filled with the comfort and the grace of heaven. No matter who you are, no matter what you're feeling or how estranged you may be from the world or from your family or from your friends, God is here for you because that's God's promise down through the ages that I'll be with you always and everywhere. I invite you to remember that sacred promise by dipping your hands in the baptismal font or some water that you might have nearby. Make that ancient sign of the cross to remember those promises. To simply remember how much God loves each of you. You're never alone. God is always here for you. Amen. In a few moments, we will celebrate Holy Communion.
Let, let me remind you that these gifts of bread and wine do not belong to our church or to any church. They belong to God. And God gave His Son not for the world to be condemned, for that, but f- so that it may be saved. God is waiting on each of you to come home. And like the prodigal son, the father waits on the porch, waiting to embrace you, to hug you, to kiss you, and to whisper to you, I love you. I have always been here for you. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he invited to his table those simple fishermen, tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes. And he said, sit and eat with me. For through you I will build my kingdom. He took a loaf of the bread and he gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And breaking the bread... He gave it to those disciples, his followers, with these words. Take and eat. This is my body that I break for you. Do this in remembrance of me so that you will know how to live as well. His followers thought about everything that he had taught them. And as the supper ended, Jesus would pour a cup of the wine He would bless it and he would give it to all of these with this promise. This is the cup of life that I pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this also in remembrance of me. May we pray. God, take these gifts of bread and wine that we have gathered before us Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here today and on all of us who are watching from home. Let these gifts become for us the body and the blood of Christ Jesus so that we who are lonely may come into your presence to be embraced by your Spirit, to be filled with the love of Christ. Shatter the darkness in our hearts. And shine the light of your love so brightly that we will never feel despair or loneliness again. No matter where we are, you are there as well. We are never alone because of your Son, Jesus Christ, who embraced us on the cross and said to the world, to all these and more, I give my life so that they might have life eternal and communion with all the saints in heaven. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. If you're at home, simply take a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup to receive Holy Communion. Will the communion stewards please come forward as we set the table? Again, like last Sunday, we'll come down the center aisle as we celebrate communion. Feel free to spend time at our chancel rail in prayer. Bring your tithes and offerings to our gold plates that will support our church's mission and ministry. And we also challenge you, if you have a pocket of change, lay that along the chancel rail. We give that change to local charities throughout our community. may not sound like much, but we've given away tens of thousands of dollars by that simple extra mile of giving. But please come. Christ is here, waiting to embrace all of you with his love and grace. Amen. There is a name I love to